Hey, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for uh, sharing your time with us. Um, you can see me on the screen there. No, that's not a lab coat. That's my robe. I, um, webinars have changed the world for us, as you know, and it's been right at about a year since I did my um, first COVID webinar, if you will. I've done a whole bunch of them since. Uh, and I do want to promote the Blues. Uh, they're almost in the playoffs again, so it could be another Stanley Cup, just saying, just in case. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop the, my video so that you're not distracted by my appearance. Ah, so here we go. Bioactive regenerative dentistry. What a great time to be a dentist, to be honest with you. There's so many cool things happening right now. We have materials that nobody dreamed of just a few years ago. So when we talk about bioactive regenerative materials, I wish I had a lot more time. Actually, an hour and 45 minutes is a quite a bit of time for a webinar. And again, I just want to uh, commend you for your commitment to learning and uh, thank you for your dedication. There's no dumb questions. So at the end of uh, tonight's lecture, we'll be going over some, uh, some of your questions and try to get things straightened out for you. I've never um, claimed to know everything about anything. Uh, now that said, I do have a lot of cl clinical experience. And I do get to play with some research stuff and all. Um, I do read a lot. However, um, I am open for um, your suggestions, your comments, and certainly your questions. Stronger together. So strange world right now. Things are going on, just all kinds of strange around us. And I just want you to know that uh, we're all in this together. And I always want to thank the sponsors first. We have some great sponsors. I'm going to do the sponsor thing a little bit different tonight. I'm going to show you some slides of materials that they have in the bioactive regenerative world. So bioactive simply means to elicit a response from a living tissue. That's what its strictest definition is. And um, I've always used the example, if you got a splinter in the palm of your hand, that's bioactive. It elicits that splinter, that piece of wood or metal, whatever it is, uh, elicits an inflammatory reaction and it's very bioactive. So what we're looking for in the dental medical world is what we call regenerative. And that's just a little bit more descriptive term for us. It just simply means to stimulate repair of tissues by providing an environment where that can happen. Ceramer um, is from a small company called Doxa, and some of you have heard of them, perhaps. It is a truly unique cement, revolutionary material. Now they have a restorative material. The trends today are to not only make things that are biofriendly and biotolerant, in other words, that aren't irritating, but also to make things that release materials that stimulate healing. So again, regenerative is what we're talking about. Cements, liners, that's kind of where it all started. Now, build-up materials, dent replacement materials. And I think all the companies we're going to be talking about tonight have those two categories at least. So um, again, Ceramer, if you know that material from Doxa, one of the great cements of all time, easy to clean up, very, very um, um, unique and wonderful. And then they just released a restorative material. And we'll kind of go over that in just a few minutes as well. Um, Bisco, uh, we're going to talk about that, uh, those materials also. Theracal, that particular slide there, is one of the materials you knew of first in the bioactive regenerative world. And that liner has been out for quite a few years now. Theracal was a light cure liner, uh, similar to MTA, and it stimulated uh, secondary dentin. Fantastic material, calcium silicate. And um, a lot of you have used it. And if you use it correctly, it is an absolutely incredible material when close to the pulp or if you had pre-op sensitivity. Along those same lines, they made some other Thera type materials. And those are materials that release calcium and fluoride. They came out with a dual cure um, material similar to Theracal chemistry called Theracal PT. And this was meant for especially for those of you who do pulpotomies in the pediatric world, or even to some degree, I don't know if this is off label or not, but if, to some degree in the endodontic world for doing um, therapeutic pulp capping. Uh, but I'm gonna, uh, we'll go over those in just a few minutes. Along the same line, 
calcium and fluoride release, Therasem. Therasem was a wonderful cement, um, still is. When it came out though, it was unique in that it was dual cure, a resin-based cement with MDP in it. So it bonded to dentin very well. And we'll go over that in just a few more minutes. And it was universal almost. In other words, we could use it for zirconia and lithium disilicate crowns. And that's incredible. So um, TheraBase is their new Thera type material. Again, similar type chemistry, and this is a dentin replacement. It's dual cure, so you can use it in a restoration that's very deep. You don't have to worry about getting the light to it. Uh, so in other words, if you're gonna replace four millimeters of dentin and your curing light penetrates two or three millimeters, we can just shine the light to get that surface cure and then finish our restoration with what we call a sandwich technique or uh, with another material over the top of TheraBase again. Shofu, thank you very much for being one of our sponsors. I've used Gyomer products for many years now, and uh, I've been in practice for over 30 years. Uh, time flies. It's amazing how it seems like only yesterday where these regenerative bioactive materials were introduced um, to the market. And now it's been well over 10 years where some of these products have been around now. So we have lots of research, lots of evaluations and clinical experience with them. So it, nothing's new about some of these materials now. There are some new formulations uh, that each one of these companies has, and, um, but the, the chemistry and the basics of the, of the materials have been around for a while now. So we're not just guessing anymore on whether we think they're gonna last clinically or not. Now we know. And Beautiful Flow Plus has been around for quite some time. It, to me, was by far the best flowable uh, composite on the mar market based on a gyomer technology. And that is basically a um, glass ionomer type material with fluoride release, only it's not soluble in water. So it's resin based and it is a fantastic material. They changed the formulation to Beautiful Flow Plus X, a little finer particle, easier to polish and a little bit different handling again, along the same great heritage as Beauty Fill. And they also had a dual cure self-adhesive resin cement, um, fantastic cement. So like Therasem, which is a bioactive regenerative cement that releases calcium and fluoride, uh, Beauty Sem is along the same regenerative type lines, different handling material, different looking material, um, but still wonderful in its own right. We've even gone as far now as to create resins um, that are self-etching. So wouldn't it be cool if you could prep the tooth and just squirt some stuff in there and be done? Well, that's where we're heading with all this. And I know some of you are glass ionomer users and you're gonna tell me that your world has kind of been like that for a long time. And I'll tell you, yes, glass ionomers have their place, but now we have by far better regenerative capacity with these newer materials and far better aesthetics and a restorative outcome. Paul Pant, um, some of you know about Activa. Well, there's a couple different formulations. There's a cement and there's a base and a restorative material. And this has been around for quite some time now when it came out and we first started playing with it. Uh, we thought it was a remarkable material in that it was dual cure. So you could fill up a very large restoration, not worry about the light getting to it again. Um, you didn't need a bonding agent with it. Uh, we were etching, doing a total etch with it, um, but it had physical characteristics and aesthetics like a composite. And in the right situation, just an incredible material. Um, again, all these products have won lots of awards. Everything I've shown you so far has have been evaluated very well with several different independent evaluators. Um, Activa also has a cement and um, Activa, you can see it in their tagline on that first picture on the left there, it says first bioactive restorative materials. Um, so um, Pulp Dent's a wonderful company. Activa is a tremendous product, several products in that line. Um, bioactive to me goes back a long, long way. And that has, uh, I mean, years ago we were using Dical which released calcium and uh, life and those kinds of products many years ago. And then we had glass ionomer products which released fluoride. Um, and so we were heading towards 
that ionic release that the tooth could use and provide therapy. We were heading that way a long, long time ago. And then a lot of you will remember MTA when it came out. Uh, we had ProRoot and some other materials, which are still around. They were just more technique sensitive and harder to use. So uh, these products have advanced the game. Um, not a game, very serious, right? And so we talk about these materials now because not only, like I said, do we have the research and um, the idea theory that they were gonna work, but now we have thousands of clinical cases, many, many evaluators, many clinicians using these products every single day and having as good or better results than they've ever had clinically in their career. Like I said, all of these companies are having newer products come out. Uh, this is Presto. Um, again, we'll go over a lot of these materials as much as we have time to tonight. And, and um, I hope that you're entertained, but also learn something tonight. So again, thank you for the sponsors. Um, and I also want to mention Catapult. It's a group of educators and um, very involved in continuing education and webinars. I know you know that or you wouldn't be looking at us right now, right? So um, again, that's a picture of me on the lower left. So let's forget that. You don't need to know that. Uh, fantastic. And this is probably my last lecture where I'm going to mention this stuff. So it's kind of like, might make myself cry here. Um, but 2020, what a year, huh? Aren't we glad that that's done? So I'm going to kind of, during this lecture, give you a little bit of a recap of 2020 from my point of view. So uh, now things are changing. The world is different. We're getting better and better and better. I have to say that webinars haven't been my favorite because I don't feel your energy. Um, now, I can't see you all. And um, for some of you, that's a good thing. Um, but for the rest of you, I'd like to at least see your smiling face and know if I'm connecting with you or not. I can't tell that on a webinar. So I'm just going to assume that you're all sitting at home in a robe like I am drinking a cold frosty one or whatever it is you do and um, you're looking at me while you're watching Netflix. And I think that that's probably what most of you are doing. So um, that's okay, no problem. First and foremost, I wanna wish uh, you and your family uh, the best. And that is health wise and uh, practice wise, um, fulfillment of life wise. Life is so short, it goes so fast. Like I said, I can't believe I've been in practice over 30 years. So I'm here to share the experience with you. And it's an opportunity for me to share with you. And it's an opportunity I take seriously and I enjoy it very, very much. So again, thank you very much. The perception of shots sure has changed, hasn't it? Like the perception of bioactive regenerative materials has changed with time. You know, it used to be, we would never mention the word shot to a patient, right? You never see the patient and the assistant says, uh, Dr. Griffin's gonna be in in five minutes to give you a shot. In fact, um, his shots are getting better. They don't hurt quite as much as they used to, but yeah, you're, you're, you're gonna wanna grab onto this chair here, hold these handles, something like that. You know what I'm saying? The perception of shots has changed for the good. And again, I wish you and your family the best because there's hope. And 2021, the cool thing about it, it has started out and things look like they're getting better from a health-wise, economy-wise, and even from a dental, dental standpoint. The only people who aren't being helped this year are those of you who are looking for housing. Because if you are, incredible what the market has done, right? Incredible. You're entitled to your own opinions. I got that. I got lots of my own opinions also, but we're not entitled to our own facts. So the kind of the theme for the lecture is I'm going to show you what's working clinically, but I also don't want to just give you anecdotal stuff that doesn't have science behind it. Like you've heard all the media people saying for the last year now, follow the science. That's exactly what we want to do. My little political statement, if you will, in this time of what seems like growing fanaticism and radicalism, let me be clear. I don't know everything about anything. I respect your right to live and practice according to your own convictions. My goal is to merely share my experience. Again, please send your questions in. It helps me um, get a feedback for what you're getting out of this lecture. And um, sometimes I can tell from your words and your questions what Netflix show you might be watching at the same time. Okay, failure. So if you've been in practice long enough, if you've done enough teeth, 
you've seen failure. When we look at failure, what we're trying to do is reduce the chances of things breaking, things fracturing, teeth um, becoming hopeless. We want to stop decay. We want to stop recurrent decay. We want our materials to look natural, function natural, and last for a long, long time. Uh, we've all seen fractures. All of these photos, by the way, are taken by me and my practice on my patients. I'm not saying I did all the work. If there's a broken tooth or restoration, one of my associates did that, I'm sure. You've all seen this, upper left, Procera crown. Um, the layering porcelain didn't match the um, expansion, expansion coefficient of the substrate, so they fractured, they just did. But when Procera came out, it was wonderful. The center upper picture is an Empress inlay. Now, back in the day when Empress came out, it was a beautiful material. And we were um, milling them in the office and cementing them. Once in a while, they'd fracture. In fact, quite often, one out of 10 fractured. So we were doing a lot of conservative dentistry at that time. And with time, we've kind of reevaluated things. So again, I'm all for conservative dentistry. You'll see that. However, certain times call for more aggressive, more durable restorations. And then across the the bottom three photos, the one on the left, the whole top came off. So we call that the convertible, the PFM that loses porcelain. You all know that layering porcelain doesn't bond well to metal. The center picture is a, an Emax crown that broke right down the center. What happened? I'm gonna assure you it wasn't the material. Um, in this case, it was the preparation. Again, we'll go over that. And then on the right photo, um, wow, well, you've seen all these before, right? Because all of this walks into your practice too. And so how can we stop this? Things get broken and then they need to be fixed. So I told Bentley, my two-year-old chocolate lab, that he was getting fixed. And he said, well, I'm not broken. I said, no, pal, you're getting fixed. You may not be broken, but you're gonna feel broken when we're done with you. So uh, there he is after his procedure with the cone of shame and um, a little bit out of it there. Uh, we're gonna go over some dog pictures tonight too. Let's start with the basics. Let's do direct restorations. Here's a simple one. Class two restoration, interproximal lesion, recurrent decay. Patient walks in, cleaning an exam and says, I can't floss one of these areas um, and I feel something moving. So here we go. You can see what's going on. Somebody did a composite. And of course the patient said it was done recently. And you know, patients don't always, they're not always so clear on times and all that stuff. But, but regardless, something came loose. There's a reason why it came loose. In this case, we're gonna numb the patient just like you do. We're gonna isolate. So a lot of you use a rubber dam and that's probably the best. No, I'm gonna back up, that is the best. There is no, nothing that isolates better than a rubber dam. However, according to the statistics, uh, almost 90% of you don't use a rubber dam routinely for restorative dentistry. Um, so 90% of us, me too. I don't use a rubber dam except for endo and cementing large veneer cases. And, but more often than not, we use an isolite. An isolite, the top picture is a way to retract. So the only reason I'm pointing this out in a regenerative bioactive materials lecture is because no matter what materials you use, no matter how good the material is, no matter how therapeutic the material is, if your attention to detail your preparation design, your removal of decay, your isolation. If those, if you don't pay attention to those, it doesn't matter what material you use. Honestly, it still comes down to you and me. How do we plan? How do we prep? How do we place? And those are the keys. In this case, we're gonna do our prep with a 330 burr. I've used a new 330 burr on every restorative patient for many years. I use disposable ones. I put a wedge in before I start drilling um, just uh, to put a little pressure on the teeth. That's called pre-wedging. I stole that idea from somebody smarter than me. Um, and so that wedge goes in before I start drilling. It protects the gum tissue, but more importantly, it pushes the teeth a little bit so I can get my matrices in easier later. So a lot of you understand that when you put a metal matrix in, they like to bend and crump, crumple up a little bit. Doc, that tooth never hurt until you fixed it. So I've talked about one little concept already and that's isolation. Concept number two, what is the bond strength to decay? Can you bond to decay? Can you leave decay? 
Well, I'm not going to argue with you on the leaving decay part. A lot of us leave decay. In fact, we all do inadvertently. Um, and some of us will leave certain decay in certain positions in the tooth. And I, and I do that as well. However, in this case, we're going to use caries indicator. We put it on the tooth, we rinse it off, and then it shows me where I missed because not all decay is colored dark. And a lot of us rely on just our vision to determine if there's decay. Some of you use an explorer to poke things, um, but still I'm better when I have help and my magnification is strong and I use caries indicator. It just helps me look to see where I missed decay. This is a deep one. Patient had sensitivity, remember, something was moving, they couldn't floss. And I think they said they were cold sensitive. So after I remove the decay, or at least most of it in the center of the tooth, I'm gonna place a therapeutic liner. That is Theracal. It's a calcium silicate light cure liner from Bisco. It's one of the ones that we showed you before. Um, it is a terrific material. Pulp Dent makes one, Limelight. That's a wonderful material also, a little bit different chemistry, but a wonderful material. Both of those are materials that we would use if the tooth had a preoperative sensitive uh, condition, or if our preparation gets us real close to the pulp. And then what's real close mean? You know what I'm saying? If you think you're deep and you think you might have a post-op problem, then we're gonna use a liner. And the liner we use is a high calcium, high fluoride releasing liner. This is Theracal. Again, um, we protect the pulp. So that goes on in a half a millimeter up to a millimeter layer of thickness, and then we light cure it well, and then we're ready for our bonding procedure. So again, that material goes directly on the um, dentin over the pulp. We don't cover the whole dentin with it. It bonds to dentin very minorly. Like if I was just gonna be using relative numbers, which really don't mean anything, but if a bonding agent is gonna give you 40 megapascals of bond strength, this might give you five. I'm just trying to give you relativeness. Don't quote me on the numbers. That's not important here, but it gives you a minor bond to dentin. So we would have a stronger restoration if we don't cover the entire dentin and we instead use our universal binding agent. So again, we place the Theracal after the uh, preparation. We light cure it. Now we're ready for our bonding sequence. The first thing the assistant's gonna do is hand me two sectionals and a wedge and a ring. The two sectionals, wedge and ring, in this case are triadent. There are many good ones on the market. The two dominating ones on the market are Triadent and Garrison. Those dominate the market because they're excellent. And so the two sectionals, obviously, um, you understand that that holds and forms our composite. Uh, and the wedge um, holds the matrices to the box. The wedge is soft and rubber and it does not separate the teeth. The ring is what separates the teeth. So again, just a little concept about that. The matrix helps us form our restoration. The wedge helps the matrix uh, push against the tooth and the ring separates the teeth to compensate for the matrix thickness. And notice the assistant handed me my plastic instrument. I burnished those two stainless steel sectionals to the middle. I just want those to be dead center right between the teeth. Selective etch, this is etch 37 from Bisco. It is a phosphoric acid etch, 37% um, that releases benzoconium chloride. So instead of using Gloom and those type products, our etch has uh, benzoconium chloride in it to help kill bite bacteria. Again, we're gonna etch selectively. So that's on the enamel only, at least that's the intention for 15 seconds, rinse it off well. Then we're gonna massage on our Universal bonding agent. This is all bond universal by Bisco. We dip and massage, dip and massage, dip and massage several times. And then we air thin the bonding agent well. Now you all know the answer to that. You air thin bonding agent to decrease its film thickness and to get rid of the solvent, the ethanol, acetone, water, whatever else is in there. We wanna get rid of that. Acetone and ethanol, your solvents in your, most of your bonding agents today, um, are pulpal irritants. So we got to get rid of those. So we have them in there so we get it onto the tooth well, um, and then we want to blow it away. And then we light cure it. Then we're going to put a thin layer of flowable composite, regenerative flowable composite over the dentin and over the Theracal and over the bonding agent. I'm going to use a little layer of gyrum or flowable. This is beautiful flow. And then we're going to light cure it. 
and I have my Denton sealed. Now, in today's world, you could replace all of the Denton at one time with Activa Restorative or Activa Liner or, or um, any other regenerative type material that is dual cure. And that's my point. Gyamers, the um, Gyamer flowable here, um, is light cure only. So we're going to place that in about a millimeter, up to two millimeter thickness, and light cure it well. And I can't tell you how long you have to cure it because it depends on the distance from the restoration you are or from the material you're trying to cure and what light you have and its intensity and all that kind of stuff. But regardless, where it matters most is the material that's covering the dentin. That's where we need our bioactive regenerative materials the most. So a lot of you ask, and I've been asked probably hundreds of times now, if you're using a bonding agent, why would you need a regenerative ion releasing filling material? In other words, when you put your dentin bonding agent on it, didn't it seal the dentin and keep the ions from going into the dentin? And the answer is yes, no. Yes, it did originally. My bonding agent seals the dentin and it keeps the ions from going into the dentin. But as the bonding agent with time fails, as it wears and deteriorates, then the ionic exchange from the restorative material works. That's when we get more of our ionic exchange. I wanna back up for a second. So we had our Theracal on um, Denton before it was bonded and we get a great ionic exchange then. The ions release from the Theracal and the Denton can use them and help stimulate Denton repair and decrease sensitivity, kill microbes, all that kind of stuff. And then we did our selective etch and then we put our bonding agent on and that kind of sealed the Denton. But when we place our therapeutic regenerative material on the outside of our bonding agent, as that bonding agent deteriorates with time, then we have our ions ready to go. Furthermore, the regenerative material that releases ions is also out at the margins and exposed to the oral environment. And they respond to the oral environment by releasing certain ions to help reduce microbes, uh, uh, get rid of the acidity, um, reduce plaque formation and those kinds of things. Again, that's where we're at in the regenerative world, what we're looking for. This is Beautiful Bulk. So we use Beautiful Flow, we light cured it, and then we placed Beautiful Bulk, which is a Gyamer bulk fill material. There's lots of good bulk fill materials on the market. And um, we're gonna go over several of those as we work through this tonight. But if you're into regular bulk fill materials, um, Beautiful Bulk from Shofu is a wonderful one. Reveal from Bisco is another great one. There's all kinds of good ones on the market. Again, we like the regenerative capacity of like a beauty fill type product. We get margins that are excellent. It doesn't polish as well as the microfill you'd use on the anterior teeth, but the durability is unquestionable. Now you'll notice in the bottom right-hand corner picture, you can almost see a perfect outline of where the wedge was. Remember that wedge was in there since the time I started prepping, that gum tissue will bounce totally right back. But what we're looking for is a deep, broad contact that does not pack food. And a lot of us have trouble with the contacts today. And like I said, it doesn't matter much what materials you use if you're um, not gonna pay attention to the basics in dentistry, prep, isolation, and um, placement. All those are really, really important. Along the same lines, now again, we're developing now. Now we're looking at materials that are really newer and that um, this particular material, Fit SA, I think I've been playing with it for, I don't remember now, two years or something like that. A lot of you have seen this or seen advertisements for it. And what it is, it is a flowable composite that is a self-adhesive. So if you could get rid of the bonding and the etching, would you? Well, now I'm just going to tell you right now that this is a newer product and I don't have thousands of cases over many years with this product. I'm going to kind of show you what the potential is and kind of where we're heading. heading. And then we're going to go into some other materials also. This is a self-adhesive flowable gymer. It's got the performance of composite without bonding. Now I want to, I want to, I want to put a little um, asterisk by that. And I want to let you know that without bonding doesn't mean that the bond to dentin or, or to enamel for sure is as good as a universal bonding agent, because so far it's not, okay? But we're showing you where we're heading with these materials. 
it looks good. It's got a good blending of colors. And as a liner under a composite, um, this could be a real good dent and replacement. Again, we're working towards materials where we're simplifying the, the steps, but I don't wanna mislead you at this point either. And I wanna let you know what really has worked so far combined with the literature. This is a new product. I'm just kind of showing you where we're going and give you some ideas on what the possibilities are. So compared to other injectable flowable composites, we've got a good depth of cure. It's hard, got a good flexural strength and it polishes well. Let's go over just one case. These are class fives. Let's supposing there's many materials you could place here. You could prep them or not prep them and put glass ionomer in there. Now, a lot of you know that when you place composites or glass ionomer into these, uh, the patient will come back a year later and say, oh yeah, that filling you put in there popped off. So as the tooth flexes, the materials we use don't flex to the same degree and they will pop off occasionally, especially if you're not prepping the surface of dentin correctly. And so what I'm gonna show you now is using fit SA and I'll go over a different technique in a few minutes. So again, these have fraction lesions, those are hard to bond to, as you know, and the farther subgingival and the deeper into the tooth we go, the harder it is to bond. That dentin changes and it is a difficult surface. Also want you to know that on a surface like this, it's very difficult to bond to this surface unless you prep the surface in some way. Now I'm not opposed to you prepping the tooth. A lot of you will take a 330 burr or a half or half round or a, a, a one round burr and cut retention grooves. I don't do that, but I can understand why you would. In my case, I'm gonna do it a little bit different. And that is that we're going to put a long bevel on the enamel. We're gonna bevel that enamel. And then we're gonna error braid the dentin. So whereas you might cut channels and grooves, what I'm doing is preparing the surface uh, for adhesion. Whether I was gonna do total etch, selective etch, bonding agent, or a self-adhesive material like Fit SA in this case. I'm gonna error braid with 50 micron aluminum oxide for a short time until the surface looks frosty. And what I'm doing is getting rid of the contaminants on the surface, you know, fluoride and Dr. Pepper and um, your other products that have contaminated and coated that surface. We've got a frosty surface. If you're going to use without a bonding agent and without etch, if you're going to use without etch and a bonding agent, this material needs to sit on the tooth a minimum of 30 seconds before you light cure it. Once you light cure it, you lose the acidity in this material. This material has to be somewhat acidic to modify the smear layer on the dentin to bond to it. And certainly if you're gonna have it etch enamel, it needs to set on the tooth a good time before you cure it. Now you and I are always in a hurry. And so waiting 30 seconds to 60 seconds sounds like an eternity to us. So with this product, I'd recommend at least selective etching the enamel, even if you don't use a bonding agent. Um, but still just giving you some ideas of the possibilities and showing you how it shines and everything. I'm gonna polish it up real well. These are Shofu polishing discs, which are incredible. And it puts a great shine on almost anything. But this is Fit SA. I've been looking at these cases for over a year. And um, so far they've been working out well, but I'm just letting you know uh, that it's a newer product and I don't have a lot of research on that. Let's get to things that have been around for a lot longer. So here's my dog and uh, he likes to swim. And uh, that's Bentley and he is concerned about UV rays. And uh, so he wears polarized sunglasses and his hat. Uh, he was a yellow lab before he started tanning. Now he's a chocolate lab. Speaking of tanning and lights, um, final curing. A lot of us don't polymerize very well. So no matter what materials we use, even if they're dual cure, and even if you let the chemical cure happen first, um, we're gonna shine a light at the end of our procedure. Other than Ceramer from Doxa, which we don't need to do that. Um, but trans enamel curing, after we're done finishing, polishing, shaping up, we have the assistant cure 20 seconds from each surface for any restoration we do. Now we don't wanna overheat the tooth, but we certainly don't wanna under polymerize the restoration. So I've given you a new product, something different. Let's get going with things that have been around a little bit longer. The quest for more durable, comfortable aesthetic restorations. Plan, prep, place. 
The two most popular indirect materials today are lithium disilicate and zirconia. Now, what we're looking for is durable, aesthetic, and comfortable restorations. Now, what we're going to do here is we're going to go ahead and go to our indirect restorations, and we're going to do some directs while we do these indirects. I don't want to confuse you. Man, it's late. I've got my Monster Energy drink here and um, my candy bar. And so if I start saying funny stuff, I might stop and take a drink here. So um, again, I know you're watching Netflix, like I said, so I'm gonna try to focus too. Here we go, lithium disilicate and zirconia. Gonna really make it simple. Lithium disilicate, you're gonna treat as a porcelain. It's silica based. You can etch it with hydrofluoric acid and silinate it. So lithium disilicate is porcelain. You're gonna treat it as porcelain. Zirconia, you're gonna treat it as a metal. Whatever you would do for metal is what you can do for zirconia. Now there's some things with zirconia that you may or may not want to do. And we're gonna go over a little bit of that. There's three main classes of, of zirconia. There's your regular old posterior zirconia. That's your ugly stuff. Remember that came out like 15 years ago? And uh, you'll remember some of the early stuff like Bruxer and those, they were opaque, ugly, whitish, tooth colorish restorations, but they didn't look real, but they were, better than a gold crown, I guess, at least as far as aesthetics. Then maybe five years ago or so, maybe a little longer now, we came out with anterior zirconia. It was less strong, less durable, I should say, less fracture resistance, but it was also less opaque. So it was blended in better, it looked better. And then now we have blended zirconias and those are zirconias that are opaque in one part of them and less opaque in the rest of it. So you can imagine in the gingival part of an anterior restoration, we could use a more opaque zirconia for strength. And in the occlusal part or incisal part, we could use an anterior zirconia for better aesthetics. You know, what we have in common is greater than what divides us. Like I said, this is kind of my last retrospective <laughs> lecture on 2020. I am moved on to other things now, but I'm doing this to uh, remind myself of what a year it was last year. And you know, the the, the, um, the world kind of wants to divide us all. You know, like we're all in different camps. We all do different things and we all look different and believe different and worship different and drink different and whatever. But you know what, especially as Dennis, professionally speaking, what, it, what we have in common is greater than what divides us. We really are working towards the same thing. And when we look at the big picture, and look at what we have in common, it is much greater than what divides us. Because you could call it me and you could call it them, and then that makes it controversial or confrontational or um, divided. Instead, we're colleagues. We're not the competition, we're colleagues. We all are in the dental profession trying to serve our patients. Of course, it's a business, but it's also a profession. We wanna do well financially and all that, but when it comes down to it, we have a lot of the same goals. It's us trying to become better clinicians, trying to serve our patients better, trying to go home every night after work, knowing that we did the best job we could given those, that situation. So let's agree on this. We want restorations that are fortifying. In other words, that strengthen the teeth. We want restorations that are therapeutic. In other words, doctor cause no harm but even more so, let's cause healing. We want things that are aesthetic because that's the world today. We live in a world where patients don't wanna come out, um, at least not knowing um, that they want things to look natural. In fact, better than natural. They want things to look better than they were given. Uh, so that's where we're at. And then we want things that are durable, of course. Nothing worse than a patient, um, than a crown you did a year or a year and a half ago had recurrent decay or or open margin or fractured. We don't want that, of course. So the two materials, again, that we're using are lithium disilicate and zirconia. You and I can become divided on this. And the reason we can is because some of you believe in Emacs, lithium disilicate, lithium silicate, those type of materials. Um, and you don't like zirconia for any reason because you had failures in the beginning with it, perhaps. Or perhaps you just thought it was just ugly or perhaps uh, it came debonded too much or something like that. So there's reasons. And I, like I said earlier, I accept your reasons, however you practice. But what we're looking for 
your things that we have in common. What can we agree on? Some of you are glass ionomer people. Glass ionomer people. Um, some of you aren't. Some of you don't like glass ionomers and haven't placed them in years. Um, some of us are total resin people. Um, I understand both categories have great advantages. Maybe we're looking for neither. Maybe we're looking for something therapeutic that's not quite either. Some of you bond everything that, that walks in the door. If it's an indirect restoration, you're going to bond it in place. Some of you cement because you don't like cleaning up bonded cement. It's too hard. It takes too long. Uh, so so there's, we can choose to disagree on lots of this stuff. But when it comes down to it, we're looking for the same end result, if you will. And so now we have choices that we didn't have before. For instance, you know, uh, about the time I was going through dental school, we of course had um, um, zinc phosphate and polycarboxylates and some other stuff. We also had glass ionomers at that time coming out and resin modified glass ionomers had just come out. Now we're way past all of those. We have other things that are therapeutic in nature and choosing what we buy and what we um, want to serve our patients with, um, there's a lot of subjectiveness to this. However, we wanna go buy things better than a magazine ad or a salesperson, or even a course like this. What we wanna do is we wanna combine the research and the clinical experience that we have and our, um, our trusted, respected colleagues have, and make choices along those lines. Moreover, you and I know that things fail and we learn from our failures more than our successes. And so that's where we have to stop and evaluate things. Whenever you look at adhesion and cementation, there are advantages to both. There are certainly reasons to cement things. In other words, to use a glass ionomer, a resin modified glass ionomer or to do class five restorations in um, Equia or Shofu glass ionomer or any of those products. There are reasons to do that. Um, you adhesive people, um, you have reasons to do resins because you know perhaps that they look better and maybe they wear better and they maybe stay on better. There are things that maybe we should discuss slightly, just slightly. Um, Second one is fortifies restoration. So that is important in our world today, especially with zirconia and Emacs, especially with Emacs. The more conservative the restoration, the more we need fortification of the restoration. In other words, you wouldn't cement a porcelain veneer with a polycarboxylate, would you? Because we need to fortify the restoration. If you cemented a porcelain veneer that's a millimeter thick, it would probably fracture right away. And so we need fortification, retention. The more retention you have, the more leeway you have in choosing your cement category. Technique sensitivity. It's easier to cement things than it is to use adhesion because adhesion requires a little bit more time and maybe some more steps, maybe, and certainly more technique with isolation and contamination control and those kinds of things. Therapy, though, therapeutic. Cements have, there are simple cements that we can just mix up, squirt in the crown and place on the tooth, like Cerama, and get fantastic therapeutic results. So again, Cerama from Doxa, we'll show you that in the implant world in just a second. There are reasons to cement adhesive people, but now we have many, several good dual cure resin-based cements that are therapeutic. And Versatility. When we use adhesion, adhesive cements that are both uh, regenerative in nature and therapeutic, um, good retention, fortifying the restorations, they're also vertical, versatile for both zirconia and lithium disilicate. Follow the science. Um, like I said, I can't believe all this stuff in the media these days about follow the science and shots and all that. I never thought I'd hear all that. Amazing. So hug your scientists today. Don't forget. Um, I'm from Missouri, of course, I got to mention Harry Truman, um, buying the right cement or the right composite or the right bonding agent cannot overcome your poor prep, your poor planning, your poor placement. In other words, it still comes down to you and me. It's you and me. And I have my good days and sometimes my days aren't so good. 
sometimes I look at my restorations and I think, geez, I, that wasn't as good as I could do. So again, we have to make sure that we understand the limitations of some of these materials. Failure is not always the material's fault. In this case, this is an uh, Emacs crown cemented with Unisem. Unisem is a non-therapeutic, non-regenerative cement. It's a good cement. In fact, it's um, one of the most used cements on the market, but it's not regenerative and therapeutic. So we have stayed away from those types of cements. But regardless, my associate placed his crown. It cracked, I think it was three months after he placed it. Again, I take photos of everything. And when my associate does something that breaks and I get my camera out, they start getting nervous. And so they, because they think, I'm, yeah, I am, I'm gonna use them. I'm gonna use them in lecture and I'm gonna show what's going on. Not that they're bad, they're not, um, they mean well. But sometimes after you prep a tooth and you put it in the mouth and you have to adjust the occlusion, maybe the thickness doesn't end up as much as you wanted it to. So in this case, you got about a half a millimeter of Emacs, that doesn't work. And I don't care what cement you use, that's recipe for disaster. When we look at these cases, I want you to consider whatever material you use, zirconia or lithium silicate, that the reason to use either one, I'm convinced right now in 2021, the reason to choose either one is not aesthetics. I used to say it was because I was taught my porcelain veneers with water powder stacked porcelain on a uh, tin foil die. Um, it was art artistry. And then Empress came out and it was great looking and lithium disilicate, I wasn't as happy as zirconia, even less so. Now we're past that. Now we can make great looking cases with all of them. Let's do zirconia first. Summarize this. This is for those of you who like outlines and lists. Let's just sum it up like the zirconia. We're gonna treat it as a metal. If you need to bond to it, you're gonna use a metallic type primer or something with MDP. We'll get to that in a second. If you have a good prep with zirconia, you can use almost any cement you want, almost anything. If your prep is less than ideal, you ought to consider some sort of adhesion, whether it's a self-adhesive, dual cure resin cement, speed sem, smart sem, therasem, maxem, unisem, those kinds of cements, or an adhesive plus a dual cure cement. Again, the more you plan, the better you prep. And sometimes we can't prep well. Sometimes the teeth are worn and there's parafunctional habits and all, and we just can't get a good prep. I got it. So then we want to rely on adhesion more. Lots of opinions. Again, you don't have, um, you don't have uh, the choice. You can't have your own facts though. And so what I'm going to talk about real quick on both of these materials, zirconia and lithium disilicate, is what we have found clinically that fits along with the preponderance of the research. Zirconia success. When some of the early studies came out, I understand your frustration with zirconia. I had it too. We didn't know what to do. We are cementing them with resin modified glass ionomers or glass ionomers. 12.5% came out within five years. And these are from a couple of very large studies and a peer review. So they, uh, uh, or an article review and, um, very, um, I understand, I, that makes sense to me that one out of 10, a little more than one out of 10 came out within five years when we used a conventional cement and zirconia. Point two, 6.6% 6 .6 loosened with a self-adhesive resin cement without a zirconia primer. So when we use a self-adhesive resin cement without MDP or a zirconia primer, we got better. But we really got good with zirconia when we started using self-adhesive dual cure resin cements that had 10 MDP in them. So let me give you an example of what we did in our office for many years. We used Ceramer from Doxa for many of our zirconia restorations. And when the preparation was good, they worked extremely well, as successful, as non-symptomatic as any restorations we've ever seen. But a lot of our patients grind their teeth, have parafunctional habits, and they, um, and then my prep's less than ideal. The thinner the restoration, 0.4, the more success depends upon your adhesion. We'll summarize that in a second. The buck stops here. It stops with me. I got to prep well. And if I prep well, I can use almost anything I want. But what about those times when I can't or I have parafunctional problems? Or maybe my preps aren't as good as they should be. On the right, each time we go down 
There's three preps there. Each prep has the same tooth. Each prep has half the retention as the one in, in, in before it. The top prep, you could probably cement it with anything you want and probably get that restoration to stay in. The bottom prep, you need adhesion. Most of our preps are in the center and most of our preps look more like not ideal, but not terrible either. So again, um, there's a lot of factors. We'll go over some of those. Everyday excellent with zirconia. Um, if you have an ideal prep and low occlusal stresses, then we're gonna try it in. We're gonna clean our restoration and then cement it with a um, dual cure self-adhesive resin cement that has 10 MDP that is therapeutic. So again, I've given you two already in that category. I've given you Therasem from Bisco and Beauty Sum from Shofu. When we cement with these materials, we want the adhesion of the 10 MDP. We want the aesthetics of those two materials, but for longevity and lack of sensitivity, we want regenerative type materials. If your prep is compromised or you have occlusal stresses that are high, grinders and clenchers and worn teeth, uh, then you're gonna try in your restoration, clean your restoration after you try it in, isolate your tooth and then cement with a self-adhesive dual cure resin cement or an adhesive resin cement. So in other words, a, a resin cement that you would use a um, universal bonding agent with. We'll go over that. Zirconia, cementation science in summary, so easy. So easy a guy from Missouri can understand it. If a prep's good, then almost any kind of cement works. Self-adhesive resin cements with 10 MDP had significantly more success than traditional cements. Poor retentive preps and or high occlusal stresses. Adhesion is not an option if you want more than 90% success over 10 years. And if you're using the more translucent zirconias, you need to go towards adhesion. So your resin modified glass ionomers um, may not be as successful. Even Ceramer, which is a wonderful therapeutic cement, may not be as successful with the more translucent zirconias. Um, 50 micron aluminum oxide or a cleaner to remove phosphates before you cement will also increase your adhesion. I won't bore you with this stuff, although it's very, very important. I just want you to know that your everyday universal or um, um, your everyday dual cure self-adhesive resin cements therapeutic that you have 10 MDP in them. I just want you to know that you should find that out. So what I'm gonna to talk to you about tonight does, we're gonna go over that. So there's MDP in lots of different things. There's bonding agents and self-adhesive resin cements and zirconia primers. Lots of them have MDP in them. Again, your job, just one time, you have to know that you're buying stuff that has it in there. Why? Because when you cement zirconia, you're gonna get a bond to the zirconia, the metal. The phosphates from the 10 MDP bond to the zirconia. And when you cement your lithium disilicate, you're also going to get a bond to the silinated surface. So there is two really good reasons to use these type of materials. When you take out, after you try them in, after you take out your zirconia restorations, um, just a word of warning that when you have blood on the inside, and sometimes you can't see it, sometimes it doesn't look as obvious as this, obviously, um, you and I just rinse them off and hand it to the assistant and the assistant's going to put her ceramer in there or her resin modified glass ionomer or whatever, and you're going to stick it on the tooth. That's fine if your if your prep is good again. But if you have blood contaminated the surface or saliva that had blood mixed with it, and you had phosphates from the blood contaminate your zirconia surface, you're going to get almost no bond to the zirconia. So again, you have to understand that that needs to be cleaned off if you want the best adhesion you can to zirconia. When you place the restoration on the tooth, you probably aren't etching and using bonding agents uh, because you and I routinely don't numb patients for single unit posterior restorations. So let me back up. The bread and butter for our clinical practices, our profit center and our best restoration services for our patient are for single and two unit restorative dentistry in a quadrant. So two crowns, one crown um, in each quadrant will do out of zirconia often. And when the patient comes back in to cement, over 80% of us don't numb the patient. I don't either, not routinely. Unless the patient's sen real sensitive with the temporary or for some other issues, 
then uh, we'll numb the patient. But otherwise, cysta pops off the temporary, very little discomfort. She wipes the tooth with a two by two, um, and, and then we cement. So if you're not numbing the patient on the cementation appointment, the patient's not numb, you're probably not gonna be able to use etch and a universal bonding agent without send, sending the patient out of the chair. So again, we have to keep that in, in mind. So now with all that said, let's go through the cases. Whenever you have contamination, you can rinse it with water, but you're not gonna get rid of the phosphates. You'll get rid of the red stuff, you'll get rid of the blood, but the phosphates will still be in the way so your 10 MDP can't bond to the surface. You can air abrade it, 50 micron aluminum oxide, or use a zirconia cleaner. Zirclean from Bisco, Ivoclean from Ivoclar, those type materials. So those will give you the maximum adhesion to your zirconia. Again, all kinds of science behind this, you're entitled to your own opinion. Oh, speaking of opinions, here's how you test in a lab. And this machine, we have a block of zirconia, we have tooth, we have a mount. You connect a cable to a hole drilled in the zirconia, and this Instron machine pulls until you get a fracture between the tooth and the zirconia. And that helps us determine, um, relatively speaking or comparatively speaking, our resistance to our, uh, failure of certain materials. This kind of machine reminds me of my practice. So here we are. Um, again, this is not politically correct. Don't do this at home. Um, and the reason I wouldn't do that at home, not that Mo is um, doing anything wrong there. It's just that I prefer physics forceps. And so I would never use standard um, uh, adjustable pliers from Home Depot. I would not do that. So I would at least use physics forceps on that. The string, whatever. Biointeractive material, all things being equal, we want our restorative materials to have a positive influence on the oral environment. Okay, we got to speed this up. Bioactive materials, let's get going on a bunch of cases. When we look at bioactive ions, the release of calcium and fluoride is what we're going for. You all know fluoride from glass ionomers and uh, topicals and all that kind of stuff. Now, calcium is where a lot of the research is. Let's get going. Broken mesolingual, distal lingual cusp, large composite, fracture in the composite, patient has cold sensitivity and sensitivity to bite, no spontaneous pain, no periapical radiolucency. Whether you do a full coverage restoration, I understand the argument both ways. Like I said, these days, I probably would do full coverage. In fact, I did. I'm gonna do my reduction with a 330 burr. That's the perfect depth cut burr. And I do my interproximal slices with that. So a brand new 330 burr down the central groove, interproximal slices and up each functional cusp. Um, whenever you use a 330 burr, the cutting tip to a 330 burr is one and a half to two millimeters deep. So that's the perfect depth cut for zirconia, lithium disilicate, whichever you use. Um, if you turn a 330 burr sideways, it's 0.75. So again, just gives you just something I'm used to. Again, you can use whatever you want. Notice also, we keep all of our margins super gingival, super gingival, unless we have to go subgingival. Why would we go subgingival? To cover a broken tooth, decay an old restoration that's subgingival, um, or for to hide uh, uh, color for aesthetics. But routinely, if we don't need to do it for aesthetics or for retention or to hide something like decay, um, then we don't go subgingival. If we can get our retention super gingival, we're gonna do it at that. So notice we're only subgingival wherever we need to. So 10 MDP based material, this is Therosome. And this is a great cement. Like I said, Ceramer is a calcium releasing cement that was wonderful, still is, easy to clean up, is somewhat whitish. So is Therosem because of the high calcium in it. Beauty Sam from Shofu releases fluoride, not the calcium. And so it looks more uh, uh, dentin like, if you will. I have to show you with these cases though, with Therosem, when the film thickness is minimal, you don't see the, the margins. You don't see a white line. So I want you to not think that you do because you don't. Um, with Ceramer, uh, we can be more likely to see a white line, but even so in the posterior, what would it matter? Um, but still, um, just being real. So we're gonna try it in, rinse, retract and cement. You know, last year was a funny year. I haven't showed these slides in quite some time. Again, this is my last time for a while to show these. 
Uh, while we were off, we were off for eight weeks because of the coronavirus. And um, just after that, I had to have my right arm reconstructed. I had an ulnar nerve transplant. And I also had um, some surgery on my shoulder and my wrists. And a few years ago, I had a disc replacement. Yeah, I know, I'm broken down, aren't I? Uh, it's been a rough life. So the doctor told me that um, I couldn't get my cast wet. And this was this, the day after my surgery. So he told me to take it easy. I am taking it easy. I'm going to water the plants. But notice, I'm keeping my arm out of the pool. I'm hardly working. I'm eating an orange over there. You can see that. And I'm watering the plants. No problem. My favorite snack is an apple. This is an apple. My favorite apples. There's a, there's a point to this story. Trust me. My favorite apples are honey crisp. To me, at night, I, I love ice cream. But every night before I go to bed, this is too much information, isn't it? I take a honey crisp back apple, I section it into eights and I get peanut butter out and I put peanut butter on a honey crisp apple while I'm watching the news. Honey crisp apple. There's my cutter. It slices it perfectly for me. I don't have to worry about messing it up. And there's my reduced fat Jif peanut butter. Fantastic, incredible. If I'm in holiday spirit, I'll put a little tiny bit of caramel in there, but not usually. There's my peanut butter on my apple. Yes, there's a point to this, hold on. What is this? I'll give you a second to think about it. What is that? That is an apple in a pool. That's an apple in a pool. Before one of my webinars last year, in fact, about an hour before, I was watering the plants like you saw, and I was working on my presentation out by the pool. I was standing in the pool with my cast out of the pool while I was working on my presentation. I got this little twitch in my arm. Next thing I know, what's that? That is also an apple in a pool. There's my MacBook Pro at the bottom of the pool. There's my MacBook Pro out of the pool, sitting on a beach towel. No, it's not tanning. I'm trying to figure out how to fix it. So I panic. This is before a lecture, you gotta remember, and I don't have a backup of the lecture on a computer. Now I could go get something else probably and use it, but I panic. So I ran to Best Buy, which is not far from here, and I took all the screws out. I had to try to see if I could fix it. I mean, you think implant parts are small. You take the screws out of your MacBook Pro. Those things are small. So much smaller than a, um, an implant. I, even a mini implant's bigger than this. I don't know how these guys do it. So I went up to the bathroom. I got my wife's hair dryer and I blowed it dry. And I thought, this came, I mean, it wasn't in the pool very long. So I didn't think this would be a problem. I know you can put it in rice and all that. That's never worked for me. So tried the hairdryer. I set the hairdryer on there for a long time. I really tried to dry it out. I got, I mean, there was no water anywhere. I was shaking it. I was doing all kinds of stuff. There's no water anywhere. I got it dried out. And um, I put the screws back in. Yeah, I know. And then I hit the button and you know what happened, right? Nothing. So again, I got nowhere with this. So I had to download a presentation on a spare computer. And so again, just giving you some of my 2020 and retrospect, glad it's over. Monolithic zirconia. This is a 20, young 20 year old patient. Look at the grinding and clutching. Look at the parafunctional habits, not good situation. Lots of other issues in this case. Um, interproximal decay, other things. Should be a full mouth rehab, should be a bite splint at the very least, of course. And we've got chipping and fracturing and wear, breaks a bicuspid in half, and we're going to restore that. Interproximal decay on both sides. Again, for zirconia, we're going to do one, one and a half or so millimeters clearance. We're going to do this in monolithic, no layering porcelain. Four to eight degrees to taper, four millimeters axial wall height. With the occlusal clearance, if we're not going to layer the occlusal, the manufacturers tell you a millimeter is all you need. I'm going to let you know that a little bit more than that probably is a better result. Half a millimeter and a half probably. Uh, if you're going to layer the occlusal, which I do not recommend, then two millimeters is what we'd look for at least. So again, just giving you some ideas on monolithic zirconia preparation. I could cement a posterior zirconia restoration with Ceramer, and it would be beautiful and work well. Remember, posterior zirconia is a more, more opaque restoration. In this case, we're going to use anterior zirconia. And in this case, we're going to use Therasem. I certainly could use Beautysem as well. We're gonna use Therosem because of the calcium and the fluoride release. Notice this is anterior zirconia with a little bit of stain on it. There is no 
layering porcelain on this. Monolithic, pure anterior zirconia. It blends in very well. Cemented with a therapeutic type cement, we get optimal gingival response. We're going to go over that several times in a bunch of cases now to give you some ideas. What we're looking for in our cements, easy cleanup, a bio-friendly, bio-tolerant uh, chemistry so it doesn't irritate tissues naturally, and something that is therapeutic that releases ions to decrease plaque and decrease acidity and microbes and all that kind of stuff to increase our longevity. Again, if it's a posterior zirconia and opaque, Ceramer would be wonderful, absolutely great. And if the retention is a little bit more sacrificed or parafunctional case like this one, Therasem, uh, even Beauty Sem would be good as well. Again, we're looking for a good soft tissue response and a good, um, good longevity. And so again, could we make this match better? Yes, we could layer the facial and make it match better if my shades were good. Um, but again, we did what we did here. Yeah, this happened not long ago. This was this winter. Um, today it was 85 degrees here in St. Louis. We had snow last week. This is crazy. I don't know what's going on. Um, but here I am laying on a road. Now, this is, these are real pictures. I don't do any of this. Like, I'm not cheating here. These are real pictures. This is me on the road after I fell. Why did I fall? My stupid dog. Bentley, being the playful guy he is, he likes to grab sticks. Notice I have headphones in. I'm listening to my favorite podcast. I listen to podcasts anytime I go walking. I take him walking three and a half to five and a half miles every day, no matter what. And here we are walking on a gravel road close to our house. And he comes up behind me with my headphones on. I can't hear him. This is kind of how it looked. Now, this is taken right afterwards. Of course, this isn't going to knock me down. Here's what happens. He drags these sticks up the road. And if I have my headphones in, I can't hear him. So he comes up behind me and he will whack me in the back of the legs with that stick or any stick he grabs. And some of his sticks I can hardly pick up, but he's like, into proving himself, you know, whatever. In the implant world, um, implantitis, periimplantitis, inflammation of tissues around the implant, as you know, you've heard it a thousand times, is recipe for disaster. And whenever we cement a crown on top of an abutment, whenever we do, um, we have to clean up the cement very, very well. More importantly, more importantly, I would strongly recommend that you cement with a regenerative cement. If you restore the implant, you own the case. And to do, it would be nice if you, I, I never want you to have to uh, be a witness or testify or anything like that. Gosh, I don't wish that on any of you. And um, however, if you were to say that I understand periimplantitis, I did all I could to decrease the chances of failure from my um, responsibility. I didn't want food to impact around the crown. I wanted well-fitting margins. I wanted nothing loose. I cleaned up the cement well, and I used a cement that was bio-friendly. That all sounds pretty good, I think, to anybody that might ask. So in this case, we're going to use a stock implant abutment. This is from Implant Direct. Notice that it's titanium. It has the internal trilobe. I've used all kinds of implants over the years. I've placed them for over 30 years, and um, I'm not saying any one brand is better than the others. I'm looking for value more than anything today. When you get a uh, stock titanium abutment back from the lab or from a implant company like Implant Direct, they are shiny. That's not good. There's two reasons that we error braid all of our titanium abutments. Number one is to increase retention. There are lots of studies. Danville Engineering has lots of them. I know some of them have been on their site um, showing you up to three times more retention by air braiding the surface first. The second reason to air braid the surface you may not have heard of before, and that is to block the color of the abutment. The reason is, is you're breaking up the deflection of light and you are creating areas that are non-uniform in thickness for the cement to grab onto. Yeah, I'll reserve that for another lecture for you. But again, we want to air or braid. There's lots of reasons to do it. Those are the two main ones. After we torque it in, we're going to torque it in at 35 Newton centimeters or whatever your screw is supposed to be. And we're going to fill the hole in with Teflon tape. On the tooth next door, now this is my first time to mention this product clinically. 
um, we are going to use Activa. With Activa, it is a different type of material. It is fantastic in many ways. Activa releases calcium, phosphates, and fluoride. I'm going to give you the lowdown on that product in just a second. But just to show you a case that we're doing, we put a real matrix on that bicuspid. We're going to fix that decay first by prepping. I'm going to do a total etch, rinse the etch off, and then fill it with Activa. Now you'll see that final restoration in just a second. On the implant uh, abutment, you see I put Teflon tape in the hole, and then I just put some Gym or Flowable, some Beautiful Flow Plus right in that hole so that we can retrieve that Teflon tape and tighten that screw if it ever does come loose someday. And I'm going to cement this implant crown with Ceramer. Ceramer is perhaps the easiest to clean up cement in the history of dentistry. And I mean that over any cement that you've ever used, glass ionomer, zinc phosphate, polyca, I don't care. It sets to a phase that's not gel-like, but kind of crunchy-like and easy to clean up. In the implant world, that's critical. The second easiest to clean up cement of the many dozens that I've tried is Therasem. Therasem also sets up to a unique state that when you let the chemical cure happen first in Therasem, you get a cement that comes off in one piece usually. So easy they are to clean up. So again, both of those are high calcium releasing floor, uh, high calcium releasing cements. So again, we want soft tissue response at excellent. I know you're looking at that second bicuspid, but that was the next one. Um, so again, I don't always get my way with all the patients. We have to work in phases. Okay, so we're gonna do some cases where we put everything together, but we're gonna do a lithium disilicate case or two as we head towards the close. Again, same thing, lots of opinions, lots of research. You're not entitled to your own facts. I'm gonna take a quick drink. Ah, refreshing. Okay, so lithium disilicate. Again, if you like outlines, if you like a cookbook, here you go. Lithium disilicate, we're gonna assume that all of them have been hydrofluoric acid etched and silinated. Your lab probably sent it to you that way, that's fine. If you mill in your own office, then you know that you have to use hydrofluoric acid and silane. If your prep's good, you need to use at least a self-adhesive dual cure resin cement. For many years, we have not recommended a resin modified glass ionomer. For many years, we have not recommended a glass ionomer. I'm not alone in this. We have lots of research, lots of groups that feel the same way. I don't want you to think that all of your self-adhesive, excuse me, I don't want you to feel like that all of your resin modified glass ionomers are gonna fail, they're not. If your prep is good and your lithium disilicate is of sufficient thickness, you probably will be fine. In fact, if you use Ceramer and your restoration thickness is a millimeter and a half or greater, you will have great success with those as well. However, these days, the research is clear that when we use a self-adhesive dual cure resin cement, especially in the regenerative bioactive world, Therasem, Beauty Sem, Activa Cement, then we have a better chance of success. Lithium disilicate, fracture resistance doubled with every 0.4 millimeters thickness. This is literature review. So every 0.4 millimeters of thickness, we doubled our fractal, fracture resistance. If you layer your lithium disilicate, you have more chances of fracture than if you use it monolithic. That just makes sense, doesn't it? If you layer anything, it's weaker. Bonded lithium disilicate, point number three, is significantly more durable than non-bonded. I was gonna give you some percentages, but there's so, such a wide variety in the research on successes, but let me just say that you will have um, more than 10, you will have much greater success if you bond in all of your lithium disilicate with a minimum of a self-adhesive dual cure resin cement. It goes from 80% success over five years up over 95% success over five years. So just giving you some ideas. Ah, let's do an example. Here's a tooth with an amalgam fractured. Bunches of cracks in the tooth. You can see horizontal fractures, vertical fractures. How do you know when to stop drilling? Do you drill until the crack's gone? Mm, probably shouldn't do that. You won't have any tooth left. 
Um, if you drill the whole tooth away, my question to you then is, do you charge or not? See, there's all kinds of reasons not to drill the tooth away. So if you do have a fracture and you have to stop at some point, we stop when there's no separation. In other words, with a sharp explorer that I can't get my pokey thing in there. Secondly, that we don't see any micro leakage along the crack. And I use Carrie's indicator to help determine that. And thirdly, um, I want to make sure that that crack is um, covered anywhere super gingivally. I don't want to go too far subgingively, of course, uh, but I want to keep it covered whenever I can. When I have a deep preparation, we're going to use a calcium silicate liner. So um, on that left there, I show you Theracal, which is a calcium silicate liner. And then there's Limelight, which is a high calcium releasing uh, liner as well. I get asked all the time about at this phase, would we use one of the regenerative um, uh, buildup materials? The reason we wouldn't is if your regenerative buildup material is a self-adhesive regenerative buildup material, it probably has 10 MDP in it. 10 MDP is a bit acidic and we don't want acidic next to the pulp. Not long-term we don't, we want them to be, be alkaline or if it's acidic to lower its acidity with time. So in other words, for real deep restorations, we will still use Theracal in those places like here at well, and then do your buildup as you're going to do. In this case, the buildup material is Activa. So what I did in this case is you could do a total etch. I didn't. The instructions from Pulp Dent tell you to total etch. In this case, I used a universal bonding agent and air thinned it. The universal bonding agent I used was Primer. It's a dual cure, um, like all bond universal, only dual cure. Um, and then I put my Activa on as my buildup. Why a regenerative buildup material after a bonding agent? Okay, so we did that already. But the thing about Activa that makes it a unique product is its flexibility. It is resilient. It has an elastic type property that reduces fracture and separation from the tooth. In other words, there's nothing worse than you have done a new crown on a patient, only for the patient to come in a few weeks later carrying the crown and that giant buildup you did is stuck inside the crown. So your buildup came off of the tooth. Your buildup stayed in the crown. Uh, not that that's a success, but certainly it's a factor. So in this case, we want to get some adhesion, obviously, as much as we can. And we want to um, provide flexure or resiliency that matches the dentin if possible. Again, um, Activa makes an incredible, a wonderful buildup material. Um, there's other ones on the market too. We're going to get to those in just a second. Theracal, ther the Thera line also has a great buildup material that's fantastic. Some have used glass ionomers. I don't because I don't like the acidity of a glass ionomer next to the pulp. So that's the reason I don't. Now, again, I'm not arguing with you or telling you what to do. I'm just telling you why we don't do that. Lithium disilicate, you've seen them before. Um, this is what we call the blue block, which is actually purple. And um, this is from a milling machine in an office. We milled for many years. Um, we're going to then place it in the oven, put a little crystallization fluid on it and a little stain. So this is totally monolithic. My assistant put a little stain on there, some crystallization fluid. We, we fired it for, I think, 13 minutes or something like that in this case. And we had it in the mouth. 30 minutes after we were done prepping the tooth. So we do a porcelain etch on it. Remember, lithium disilicate, we're gonna treat it as porcelain. Therefore, porcelain etch, 4% porcelain etch, 5% maybe, no more than 20 seconds, and then silane. So this is porcelain etch from Bisco and Bisilane. And we're going to um, try it in. The surface should look frosty, not chalky. And um, then we're going to cement. In this case, this is a dual cure self-adhesive resin cement. This is Beauty Sim. To give you an idea of what it looks like, this is Shofu's Gyamer. Gyamers help neutralize plaque, acid, decrease microbes. They look like all of the self-adhesive dual cure resin cements you know on the market. Not quite as white as Therasim. Again, I showed you that the Therasim doesn't affect the final restoration color. Um, 
to a large part. And um, whenever we use beauty sound, we get the ultimate in aesthetics and we get to um, treat it just as you would a dual cure sulfur adhesive resin cement. Again, uh, lithium disilicate, monolithic, a little stain at the gingival half, and a very successful long-term restoration in our office, even if I prep it bad. Um, doctor, are there side effects to the vaccine? Yes, there are side effects. There's conspiracies, ignorance, and misinformation. Uh, again, I, I hope you all have had your vaccine. I got mine quite a while ago. I wasn't even sick or sore, really, and I'm pretty much a wimp. I have to close my eyes when they give me the injection, and I have to hold on to the table. So I know I'm not a good patient. I know that. You know, I just, um, I'm not good. Uh, but um, I don't want you to be ignorant and misinformed about these type materials either. I want you to know the benefits um, and the limitations. Lithium disilicate preps look a lot like zirconia preps. There are similar reduction in all directions except occlusally. We want a little bit more occlusal reduction. I said one to one and a half millimeter occlusal reduction for monolithic zirconia, but one and a half to two millimeters occlusal reduction for monolithic lithium disilicate. In this case, same thing, we're gonna fire it in the oven. Your lab probably sent it back to you, etched and silenated, if you're not a milling office, so you don't have to worry about this step at least. In this case, we're going to, after we try it in, and in fact, in my world, after we mill, we try it in after we mill, then, then we, um, etch and silenate it. But, but regardless, after you try it in, you're going to clean your surface. If you use a zirconia cleaner like Zerclean or Ivoclean, you must reapply the styling. So even though your lab silenated, if you try it in, if you get the contaminated surface, same with zirconia. And if you used a zirconia cleaner like Ivoclean or Zerclean, then you must reapply the styling to lithium disilicate because it does, the cleaner will remove the styling as well. Again, uh, second molar, that's a lithium disilicate crown cemented with beauty sound. You get a very nice, nice um, aesthetic result. And the margins are excellent. And like I said, um, even in my world, this has worked. I told you I take Bentley to the park all the time. I did get a new truck last year. I'm, I'm not bragging uh, because the inside doesn't look new anymore. Um, he gets, he, he's a lab, so I can't keep him out of the lakes. So he's always jumping in the lakes. And then um, if we walk on a gravel road, he shakes and does his thing in there. And um, I've got these other pictures of me cleaning my truck out. And I found a egg McMuffin under the seat that had been there over six months. It was rock hard, he still ate it, but whatever. Uh, okay, so let's get going. A little bit more intense on our cases here. Amalgam, prep do your thing, whatever it is you do. I take a digital impression in your world, whatever kind of impression you take. Now, if I'm milling in the office, notice I don't have the amalgam out on the buckle. I'm gonna remove that while it's milling. In your world, you would remove that probably and put some sort of block out material in there for the lab. In fact, you might do a buildup on the entire tooth. Um, Activa works very well for your buildups, uh, but I'm just saying that in my world with milling, my patient's numb, I'm going to be able to use etch and a universal bonding agent. I'll also be able to take that amalgam out while the milling's happening so that I can not waste any time. Uh, in this case, for my blackout, I'm gonna use Theracem, excuse me, Theracal, and um, that light cure it. And I've just got a little block out there. Again, you would probably do a buildup over that, then take your impression. The point is on this frosty surface, been silenated. This is Theracem. So again, I showed you some beauty sem cases. I've showed you some, um, some um, Saramer cases. Now we're heading towards Activa and Theracem. This is cemented with Theracem after we clean up. Again, we're looking for tolerant uh, bio-friendly materials that the soft tissues aren't irritated by. I keep my margins super gingival when I can, and you don't see a white line at the margins. Now, my assistant did not put stain on this one, so it is totally monolithic with no, um, no alteration in color. So whatever block that color was. Okay, some other stuff. Let's get going on this. Everyday excellent. We're trying to find materials that are simple to use, easy, almost universal in how they, they work, and things that you can use in any situation. 
similar techniques, similar um, theories, whether the restoration is posterior or anterior, direct or indirect. Once you know the chemistry or science a little bit, not a whole lot, but if you know it a bit, then you know what to look for, what to ask for, and how the world is changing in dentistry today. This case is interesting. I did these composite veneers 15 years before this out of a material called heliomolar. So some of you may or may not remember the two first posterior composites that I remember were heliomolar and herculite. And I don't know if heliomolar is still on the market even. I think herculite is, but I think it's been changed. But those were the first two and then Durafil, I think I remember. Uh, so, so anyway, these heliomolar composite veneers I did many years ago, I just freeformed them on the teeth. Notice they're worn and chipped and stained. They look better when I place them, but they, stip, <laughs> they uh, chip and stain more and more as time goes on. And this is an enamel dysplasia case. This patient was born with defective enamel. Notice all of her teeth have something on them. Now, this patient got lost from me. She moved after college. She got lost. She's had some restorations done in the posterior, some PFMs, I think. Um, maybe a, there's a zirconia or two in there. I don't know. Um, now, she comes to me after all these years, and we're going to work in the anterior. Um, I'm going to do the maxilla in lithium disilicate. I'm going to do the mandible in zirconia. Am I telling you to do that? In fact, is that a good idea? No, not necessarily. I do it to try things, and I may even do these cases complementary for the patient or at a great reduction so that I can try things and give you reports with time, which I'm gonna do in this case. So let's get going on this. Occlusion matters, it always matters. And when you pick a, a material, so like I said, in this case, I talked to you about Ceramer, how good it was, but when you're going to do cementation of crowns in this case, we need a self-adhesive dual cure type resin material. So I would head towards Therasem in this case, or Beauty Sem or Activa Cement more than probably Ceramer. Why? Two reasons, aesthetics and increase in retention, especially if there's buildups in the teeth. I'll go over that more in just a second. I just took off the composite. In fact, I didn't even get all the composite off. You see still composite that I left on there. I'm showing you what her enamel looked like before the the uh, composite veneers. It was stained and you can see the rough scratches from my coarse diamond. Now she has an proximal decay, defective enamel. She wants an aesthetic result. She wants, and she doesn't have a lot of money. This is a situation where it was difficult. However, I'll show you what we did. We're gonna take our impressions. I did not do any gingival recontouring with a laser. So this would not pass as my accreditation case with the American Board of Aesthetic Dentistry or anything like that. However, just a general restorative case. Her preparation was about A3. I don't care that the A, B, C, or D is right. I care that the value is right, that the lightness and darkness. So that the ceramist knows how opaque to make the restorations. Again, I asked for lithium disilicate on top and zirconia on the bottom. I'm not saying that's a good idea or recommended because of different wear of the materials. However, in this case, I'm gonna give you three choices of cement that you could use for either material, lithium disilicate or zirconia. Regenerative cements, Therasem from Bisco, Beauty Sem from Shofu, or Activa cement from Pulp Tent. All of them are excellent materials. And in, if used correctly, they all provide excellent results. Therasem, in this case, we're going to use both upper and lower. Calcium silicate cement reduces, or releases calcium and fluoride in a form that the tooth can use. That's important. Just because a material releases fluoride or calcium doesn't mean the tooth can use it. It has to be in a proper form that is um, exchangeable with the tooth. Anyway, so here you are with lithium disilicate on the upper front, eight teeth, I believe, or 10 teeth. I cement them all at once. I turn my light off and Therasem is a dual cure material. Notice it's somewhat white but it is not opaque. When it is thin, it is almost transparent. So all I'm showing you is before it cures, how it looks. I wait for the chemical cure to happen first. I do not shine a light at this material until after we're done cleaning up. That's my philosophy with all the dual cure resin cements. 
some, not all, but some of the research shows us that we get a higher degree of polymerization, in other words, more stable margins, if we allow the chemical cure to happen before the light cure. Again, there is debatability that is debatable. And, and so I have been convinced fairly surely um, that I let the chemical cure happen first. Clean it up, floss everything before I shine a light. But I always do shine a light at the margins afterwards. Cemented the zirconia on the bottom the same way we did from, I don't remember now, honestly, I don't remember if we did first buy to first buy on top, which is what I think. And we did second buy to second buy on the bottom. So that's monolithic zirconia on the bottom, anterior zirconia, and a layered lithium disilicate on top. Just showing you the universality, the universalness of these materials and the soft tissue response. Um, again, we're looking for longevity and things that are um, easy to use, therapeutic, bio-friendly. We've been over all that, right? So again, showing you lithium disilicate and zirconia, what we do and how we do it. Take your photos a couple weeks later. In this case, these photos were taken, um, I think it was two years later on a recall visit. Uh, so I'm just saying that you, you want healing, but you also want time to evaluate how therapeutic your materials are. Hey, now this slide's wrong now, but I have to tell you that since uh, COVID happened, uh, my wife and I watched our first three Netflix series. Now it's four after last night. I've watched The Queen's Gambit. Fantastic. Incredible. I had no idea that there was such good stuff on TV because I'm not a TV person. Uh, sporting events, yes. And um, Stranger Things, the, one of our kids talked us into watching that. It was incredible. And The, the Crown, all those are fantastic. I just, and the reason I'm bringing these up is if you have suggestions on a uh, great Netflix series for me to watch, uh, put it down um, and uh, in the questions, that, that'll help me out. I did, we did finish one last night. We watched the last one last night. It was as good as all of these, I have to tell you. It's called Dead to Me. And um, it's incredible uh, surprises in, in it. I thought it was excellent. So Dead to Me is what it's called. Anyway, just incredible. Okay, so let's do monolithic anterior and posterior zirconia. Let's do some buildups and all that. Let's get going and finish this up real quick. Monolithic anterior zirconia, six through 11. We're coming up close to the end here. We got about 10 minutes or so. And I wanna, uh, want you to, don't forget to send your questions. And I know some of you will check out early here, but I do have some good things for you coming up. So just be patient, thank you. Um, remember the phosphates in blood contaminate the surface so your MDP can't bond to it. The phosphates in blood take the place of where the phosphate in the 10 MDP would bond to. That's what the P stands for. So air abrasion is better than rinsing and a cleaner is probably better than both of those. So um, retentive preps, we're gonna try it in. Zerclean, rinse, dry, self-adhesive, dual cure resin cement. Could be Therasem in this case, which it is. Could be Beauty Sem from Shofu. Could be, um, it could be, um, um, oh my gosh, I'm getting tired. Um, it could be uh, Activa cement, and even it could be, if the restoration's opaque enough, it could be serum. In this case, with anterior restorations and multi multiple restorations, I usually will numb the patient, even though there's two necrotic teeth here, you can see them dark, her upper left cuspid um, and her right second by, those are necrotic dark teeth. Uh, but in, in this case, I'm going to clean my preparations. Um, I'm going to to uh, clean them with a micro brush and 2% uh, chlorhexidine. I use cavity cleanser from Bisco. And then um, I'm ready to go and cement. These are done with Therasem. I cement them all at once. I find it much easier, much more predictable. Now I've tried them all in, of course, adjusted them wherever they needed to be. These are monolithic restorations, by the way. These are anterior zirconia. There is no Larian porcelain in here, none, zero. So again, I'm just showing you what we can do with anterior zirconia these days. Oh, gosh, I stand totally corrected. There's our anterior zirconia is three to three, so cuspid to cuspid. Posterior zirconia on the posterior teeth. So the bicuspids and, and first molars. I'm very sorry, I misspoke. Anterior zirconia in the anterior, as you can notice the translucency, look at the cingulum areas of the incisors that you can kind of see through them a little bit. In fact, on her tooth number 11, that upper left cuspid, you notice that the necrotic is showing through the cingulum area. Now, it doesn't show through much on the an anterior or the facial, I'm sorry. Uh, but anyway, again, giving you some ideas on the materials that we use and how we um, 
do them thinking of therapy. Speaking of that, when masks came out, you know, I take the dog to the park. Um, I told Bentley to try a mask on, put a mask on. It's what the, they're calling for. You need a mask. And so he wasn't totally clear on this. I heard Chocolate Labs uh, were the dumbest of the three labs. There's a yellow lab and a black lab. And he, yeah, he is the dumbest. There's no question. I've had several uh, retrievers, but he is fun. He puts the mask on like a hat. Said, no, dude, it's not a hat. You've got to pull it down for It's not going to work there. And so he pulls it down. So still not exactly getting the concept. Now just get your eyes so you can see. And so there he is with one eye open. Uh, but anyway, yeah, he's trying to get the idea. Let's do some other stuff here. This is a blended zirconia, giving you some ideas. Let's go through the case real quick. This is monolithic zirconia. That is posterior zirconia at the gingival half and anterior zirconia at the incisal half. We've got bite issues. We've got a parafunctional case. She should be a full mouth rehab. That did not work. Trust me, that treatment plan was presented. We're gonna do some tissue recontouring. We're going to take our impressions, however you do it. This is IPS Emacs Zercad Prime. So long story short, this is a material that is incredible. It has a posterior zirconia at the gingival half and it's, it's in a block and it's blended to an anterior, more translucent zirconia in the incisal part. Your ceramist, depending upon your ceramist, controls that. They can put stain within the material, that's called infiltration. Um, but I'm telling you, we're heading in such beautiful, great directions with all of this stuff. It's just amazing how much better dentistry is now than just a few years ago. Ah, this case, tough, but we got a decent result. Let's take a look. Here's what I want you to know. This case is far from perfect, but you have to be realistic with yourself and your expectations. Let's do some Activa and show you the possibilities of 100% regenerative restoration from the buildups to the gum treatment to the final restoration. So here we are. When I see wear like that, I always think of acid, right? You have to think of acid. You always ask the patient if they have gastric reflux or something like that, and they always say no. Uh, you always ask them if they burp, belch a lot or burp or anything, and you, know, you don't wanna ask a lady that. I mean, not, not really. Um, and, but, but you got to get to the bottom of things, right? Because you want things to last. Uh, you think of acids, whether it's internal or external sources, um, the age, opposing, abfraction, abrasion, um, whatever else is going on here. They always say they don't grind their teeth. So you've got to be, a, you got to be Sherlock Holmes there a little bit and figure it out. When we see abfraction and wear on the molars, we're almost always thinking acids, which is another reason to use a regenerative cement whether it's Ceramer, Therisem, Beautysem, Activa Cement, they all neutralize acids. They all reduce plaque formation. But a neutralization of acids, especially on a patient with gastric reflux or that has some sort of wear that you suspect could be from acids, then you've got to consider doing whatever you can to um, reverse course, if you will. Activa, like I said, bioactive regenerative material. There is a bioactive liner and a bioactive restorative. I use the bioactive restorative for my buildups. And if I'm going to do a top to bottom restoration out of a bioactive material, for instance, in the pediatric world, almost all of our restorations are of Activa restorative. We do a total etch, we rinse the um, etch off, and then we put our Activa restorative. You can use a bonding agent, no doubt, probably in the long run may reduce some sensitivity if you do, and you do get a better bond, but you don't get as much of the ionic exchange, no question. The Activa bioactive liner is a, a dentin replacement. It doesn't have the wear to put in occlusion, so you wouldn't want it there. But again, as a buildup material, fantastic because it flexes with the tooth. And if you remember that necrotic tooth number nine there, we used uh, Activa um, and tried to block out that color. We did pretty good. Again, we're looking not necessarily at the color, but we're looking at more the value. We have a full crown next to a veneer, may or may not be easy or hard for you to do. Some of you, because you have um, a crown next, you have a crown on tooth number 
on one of the incisors that was already prepped, you're tempted to crown them all so that you have a consistent restoration. I don't do that. Again, it depends a lot on your technique and what labs you work with and all that. But in this case, we have layered restoration. So we got zirconia that's layered. Uh, zirconia, the old zirconia can be very opaque. And so it can block dark colors very well, almost like a metal. Uh, after you try it in, if you need maximum adhesion, then you're going to use Zerclean or IvoClean. On the crown, on the full crown prep, that's a zirconia restoration. We're going to bond that in place. On the other restorations, they are lithium disilicate. Again, should you do that? No, not necessarily. Again, I do it more um, to play with things, but not, not to play really, but to show you the possibilities. And so we blend materials frequently because I have a lab that I trust and all. We're going to clean the teeth with preppies, which is a non, um, not profi paste. It is flower pumice. Put a couple of drops of cavity cleanser in it. We clean the teeth very well after we take the temporaries off. Again, I've skipped a lot of this case because of time. We're heading towards the end here. We're going to clean the restorations very well. We're going to do a total latch on the veneers so that we can bond those in place. When we bond those in place, we're gonna use a dual cure universal cement. Like I said, normally we use all bond universal or primer, and then we're going to cement. We're gonna cement the full crown with um, a duo link, which is a dual cure resin. It definitely could be Therasem or something like that. On the veneers though, we're gonna use a light cure only cement. In this case, it's choice two you could use a lot of other veneer cements on the market. The reason for light cure only is so that we don't get surprise shade shifting and so that we have more working time. What you can't see in this picture is that the lights are off. I have a filter on my headlight and when I take a flash photo, of course it lights up, but otherwise we won't have the light on. I have infinite working time almost, almost uh, with a light cured veneer cement. We both clean up, my assistant and I, we even floss everything before I shine a light. You can tack cure if you want to. Again, just be careful uh, about over curing because I hate to clean up resin that's been set. We don't, we don't cure in my world until we're af after we're totally cleaned up. If you're gonna tack cure, know the intensity of your light and how long it takes before you over cure. Again, so lithium disilicate that's been layered and then we evaluate soft tissue response, aesthetics and all that stuff afterwards. Perfect case, nope, I've never done one. As we wrap things up, um, I get about a minute here. Again, when we look at all of these materials, what an exciting time to be in dentistry. I can't imagine practicing in any other time. I don't know, um, I don't know what I would do if there was none of this stuff around. It's exciting, it's different, it is um, just, it's a, it's a rewarding time to be a dentist. Let's go through some questions. I always get asked about Theracal. There's always a few issues with Theracal, not issues, but things to understand. Number one, um, when you put Theracal on, it should be fairly thick. It shouldn't run all over the place, but you should be able to smear it with the tip of your um, micro syringe. So I put it on with a little syringe. I use one of those little needle tips I put it on the, um, on the dentin, just covering the part right over the pulp. And then I light cure it well. It's a very thin layer. It is only a half a millimeter or so layer thick. And so in that case, I can cure it real well, but you smear it around with the tip. It shouldn't run all over the place and it shouldn't be chalky looking. Um, so again, Theracal should be placed on a moist tooth, not over desiccated. And a lot of you had um, rinsed it off in the beginning. You were drying your tooth too much or not curing enough. Those were probably the biggest two problems we had were after you placed the Theracal and did your etch and rinse, you would rinse it off the tooth. Again, apply to moist tooth, light cure well, then a universal bonding agent over the top of it, then you're ready to go. Um, any opinion on red or green carries indicator? Um, green goes with my eyes better. So generally I like green, uh, but red makes me look taller. So um, no, I, green is better to me. I can see it better, especially if there's only a small amount on the tooth. It just shows up better to me. 
am I concerned about error braiding on dentin that might plug up the tubules? Well, that's a great question. Incredible. I haven't even thought of that in years, but yes, we used to think about that all the time where the aluminum oxide might occlude the tubules and interfere with our bonding or our ionic exchange. Um, Michael, great question. I use 50 micron aluminum oxide, which is less likely to occlude tubules than 27 micron. The bigger particles less likely to infiltrate into tubules. Secondly, we rinse very, very well. Thirdly, if you were to do a total etch, which I don't, but if you did, you would re again reduce further the chance of occluding tubules with that. The answer is, do I worry about it? No, not worry. It, was it a concern? It was some day ago. Um, because of their different properties, what about bonding to zirconia? Can you get a stronger bond to anterior zirconia? Uh, the, the best way to get a strong bond to anterior zirconia is on the tooth itself is to use a universal bonding agent, air thin it, like cure the universal bonding agent. And on your crown, after you try in the zirconia to use a cleaner, rinse it off, and then use a MDP containing therapeutic resin cement like we talked about. If you're cementing Emax crown, why not use Variolink? Why not? Because Emax crowns, especially in the posterior, I'm not sure that my light's gonna get through to all my cement because if your light doesn't get through, then it may not cure. Your dual cure um, materials from Ivoclar, yes, work, work well. And you certainly could use those. Are they regenerative or therapeutic? No. So that's the main reason that I don't. All those materials are great though, but when we look at um, the combination of excellent work, great retention, aesthetics, um, fortification of restorations and therapy, again, uh, we can't use everything, but we can use a lot of stuff. And so we head towards the regenerative market. Does phosphate contamination from saliva really affect uh, bond strength to zirconia? Um, so saliva itself has proteins and other stuff in it. Um, but more often though, our saliva is mixed with blood and the phosphates is what is the real concern. But removing proteins from the surface before you bond to it is good as well. Removing any other contaminants. That's why at the very least a rinse, better yet air abrasion and better yet on zirconia, um, a zirconia cleaner. Now we don't air abrade Emacs because Ivoclar tells us not to. Now I'm just telling you that a lot of people in the milling world do because we have to remove our, um, we have to mount it when we put it in an oven. And so we do error braid that out, but you gotta be careful. You can't have too much pressure and all that. So yes, I agree with Ivoclar, stay away from the error abrasion on, on Emacs and instead use a zirconia cleaner, but then you have to reapply the silane. Um, organic solvent to clean the prep, uh, I don't. I use 2% chlorhexidine, not Paradex, not mouth rinses. Paradex and mouth rinses on the tooth, have oils and flavoring agents that might interfere with your bond. So we just use pure chlorhexidine, light cavity cleanser from Bisco, but any pure chlorhexidine is very cheap and does a great job of cleaning. And it has a substantive effect of continuing to kill bacteria. Microfractures are a concern in every material. Great question, Michael. Um, when you sandblast lithium disilicate, the research in the past has shown very clearly that we cause iatrogenic microfractures. With zirconia, posterior zirconia that I know of has not been significantly associated with microfractures, posterior zirconia. Anterior zirconia, I have seen where someone has suggested microfractures. Um, but in my world, I have not seen an effect from that. So um, again, I'll defer you to any research that you would find. Again, I sandblast the zirconia. I don't generally sandblast lithium disilicate per manufacturer's directions. Is polished zirconia better than glazed zirconia? Wow, great question again. That guy's thinking. Um, uh, there's research that shows that polished zirconia is actually smoother and slicker and less likely to accumulate plaque than glazed zirconia, fired zirconia. So I'm not going to argue with that. A polished glass surface, even when I was in dental school, didn't have oxides in it. So it wasn't as abrasive to the opposing dentition and was less likely to 
um, accumulate plaque. Now that said, well glazed porcelains and uh, well finished zirconias out of the oven are very good, but there's porousness in all glazes and all layer, layering porcelain. So they do tend to accumulate more than a polished surface. That's a wonderful question. Um, do I recommend bioactive materials for all composite restorations? I do. So my composite restorations are a gymer liner or a regenerative buildup material um, like, um, like, like uh, Activa or one of the other, oh, like the Theraline from Bisco and, and to replace your dentin and then I cap it with a uh, bulk fill composite. Um, and there's a bunch of good ones on the market. So I do have times when I don't do a quote regenerative therapeutic type composite. On anteriors that are highly aesthetic that I wanna use multi-layering, um, I tend to use other materials that have better aesthetics in my hands. Um, and as the um, layering porcelain on a sandwich technique composite in the posterior where I used a therapeutic dentin replacement. All right, on zirconia crowns, um, uh, you clean with IvaClean and then Aero Braid. Uh, David, I don't have an answer to that because I've always done it the other way. Uh, if, if I'm gonna Aero Braid and use a cleaner, I probably would um, Aero Braid first and then use my cleaner to remove any of the aerobrasion things that are left over. Maybe, maybe. Um, Ruth, uh, I don't use a seeding jig. I only use a seeding jig when I cement implant crowns, um, but I don't. Again, I uh, do a lot of things freehanded that perhaps you shouldn't, uh, but I don't. I use, I try them all in. I am confident in um, my staff's abilities at this time. My assistants are incredible. They just hand me the stuff. I put it in the mouth and it seems to work out for me. Chlorhexidine, um, does it have an effect with Therasem? Um, if it has an effect, it's positive, okay, but not negative that I know of, okay, not that I know of. Um, greetings from Switzerland. Uh, somebody's told me thank you from Switzerland. Here, here's here, you don't have to thank me. Just send me an airline ticket and I'll come over there and lecture. That's all you have to do. No thanks needed. Or Bitcoin, boy, Bitcoin is fine. Um, Z Prime is a wonderful MDP containing material. Zirconia primer, metal primer, awesome, no question. Um, can you use SDF other than Theracal? Well, SDF, um, no, Theracal and SDF are not uh, interchangeable. Um, and I'll kind of leave it at that. Um, silver diamine fluoride is, um, if that's what you're referring to, I, I think it is, but SDF to me is silver diamine fluoride. Um, uh, I don't put Theracal over silver diamine fluoride and bonding to silver diamine fluoride is very difficult. Uh, I air abrade and put a universal bonding agent on it. Um, do all bonding layers break down with time? Yeah, all restorative materials break down with time. I'll just leave it at that. There are enzymes and other things that attack our bonds to dentin. They always degrade with time, always, uh, that I know of. Do you think there's benefits to using Activian on pedo patients? Yes, especially with enamel problems and stuff. I don't have to rely on an etch of the enamel, but Activa is a wonderful material to use in the pediatric world in general. Really good. Um, benefits for Activa. Um, again, Activa is a wonderful product. I, I, I don't have anything negative to say about Activa. Just from every point of view, it is a wonderful material. So thank you all for sharing your most valuable asset with me and that's your time. I really appreciate it. And I didn't get any um, recommendations on Netflix, but you can email me those if you want to. And um, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Stay safe out there and good luck to you all.